Mm -mm -mm. Uh, hello, Disillusioned. Um, thanks for the follow last week. Well, it's been two weeks now, right? Um, I'm just catching up on my forum here. Uh, some things I haven't read yet. So I'll probably spend maybe an hour doing this. Usually, it's been a week. I haven't read anything, hardly anything on the forum for a week. So I'm going to go through and read everything. This person, Mac, I think has is sort of a newer user, joined October. You can, you can watch all day in the background. I'll be on most of the day, honestly. If the research meeting doesn't go on very long, I may just continue <clears throat> um, working on some things I need to do. Uh, with, with Twitch, I wanna work on context switching because I'm gonna have different types of streams and I wanna set up automation so I can press a button and switch between like what I'm doing now and a research meeting because I'm just, I wanna flow right into it. And then when the research meeting ends, I may wanna to switch to a technical stream and I wanna have a button to push to just do that. So I'll, I'm gonna do that so, I, so my streams will be more fluid. So I might work on that a little bit today. Uh, okay, I try to use HTM for solving anomaly detection, system produces logs. I, this sounds familiar. Uh, system work in cycle manner one process ends and another same process begins okay okay so he's got a period each log contains a thousand samples each sample contains ten different features that represent the current system mode categorical features train the HTM on 40 different I think he's I think I've talked to him about this him her I don't know uh, this sounds familiar we I think we had a discussion about this On the detection for multiple features. Because um, this sounds really familiar. There was somebody else that had a similar thing. They had a, they had a, I don't want to tribute. Oh, he's talking about multiple predictions there, which we can't do. <laughs> uh, well, can can do, it's just no one's written the code to do it. <laughs> I, trained an H, I trained an HDM model on 40 different valid logs first SP, then the HTM itself. So I don't understand that. The, H, the SP is part of the HTM. If you're training it, I think, I assume you're saying the TM, the SP and then the TM, because they really should probably train together. But it doesn't matter. You could train the SP full up and then turn on training and the TM. Let me first make this correction, this terminology correction. That's a good suggestion. Um, Let's see. I think you mean you train the SP first, then the TM, right? HTM is more of an umbrella term for the full technology. We've got to try and keep terminology correct. If we can't. If everybody doesn't agree on what to call things, um, it gets more complicated. So, uh, okay, the training be done after log, training the first one, then the second epic. In the evaluation phase, I take another 100 different valid logs and apply on them the training HTM model. And all 10 log, I don't quite, so you don't really have to, 40 different valid logs. Training can be done log after log. Training with one first one, then that, so he's so he's saying logs are like one epic, I guess, or one session. Then he's got forty different sessions. Um, not certain. So the, so in all ten logs, the first sample received high anomaly score, which is expected. I would think, because it's never seen anything before. I received high anomaly score in all the 10 evaluation logs in the same samples, even the logs, even the logs was different one. Yeah, we need to see the data, definitely. Um, I do want to say that this is not unexpected. Um, I would say, the anomaly score should 
go down overall as um, patterns are learned. And I agree with Max here. We definitely need <clears throat> to see data. Okay, I am gonna try this and do screen markers, stream markers and, and post snippets of this back to the forum. I don't know if it's gonna work. Updates to neuroscience. Oh yeah, we saw that. I already saw that. Um, <clears throat> Skynet joke. I almost made a Skynet joke back. Jimmy, you travel into the US for conference first week of June. Staying in Union Square area of San Francisco. Oh, that's cool. Okay, um, I need. think I need to. Hey, Richard, you're gonna be in San Francisco <laughs> the first week of June? I think I should probably Monday, 3rd June is probably the best day for me. I'm also around in the evenings of 2nd, 4th, 5th, 6th. I'm gonna make a note about that. Maybe we can, <clears throat> maybe we can try and get a meetup going. June. What do you guys think? Anybody um, interested in maybe Having a meetup. Um, let me look at my calendar. April, May, June. When my kids off school. <laughs> I'm thinking about when my kids are off school. Okay, let's 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 think about that. Who is interested? I could put this on our meetup page and uh, help with arrangements if if there is enough interest. Uh oh, my, my double just died. I've got a got a, a robot double connected to the mint office and it just went away. I don't know what happened to it. It was so good for so long. Um, issues with getting anomaly parameters. Oh wait, I missed this. Base. Oh, I love. Yeah, I really liked this. This was cool. This one makes you conscious for the hub connections from temporal to prefrontal lobe. I can see that. Until rhinol, hippocampal complex, amygdala, hypothalamic clusters. So I'm in, I'm trying to learn the hypothalamus stuff now. Um, in my uh, my brain coloring book, I'm I'm am <laughs> in the parts of the I'm in the thalamus hypothalamic connections area. And uh, anyway, this is cool. I already I already read this, but. I think I already hearted it too. This is great, and I already gave him a badge for it. You know what we should? This is a gr this is a great post, Mark. Um, issue with getting anomaly parameters instead of swarming. Okay, where where was I on this? If the model creating those results. Oh yeah, I couldn't figure out why Freeman was having this problem. Inspect the model instance and ensure it's an HTM prediction model. Uh, so, so this is tr troubling me. So the model is definitely an HTM prediction model, but when he runs, when he runs run, the inference, the results object that he's getting back, doesn't have good results in it. Hello, hello, pi two three five. How are you doing? I'm I'm updating or I'm uh, I'm getting updated with this forum that I manage called HTM forum and uh, people ask questions about HTMs there and I answer them and I don't know why this this is so confusing okay I'll just say it this is confusing oh there's even an emoji right confounded is the one I like eh. <laughs> um Okay, he even posted his code, so I should look, I need to look at the code. Where did it go? Here it is. 
So why? Hello, Mark Brown. Welcome, I was just talking about you. I'm trying to figure out why Freeman or Razvan his, this issue he's having with uh, model results, why is it even happening? He's getting a results object back that doesn't have the proper inferences. Like, it, so I'm trying to figure out why. This code looks familiar. I, I think I wrote it. I mean, the, for the example. I know because I hate this function. I hate this function. <laughs> It's uh, uh, okay. So the actual run is in that function, I believe. Right. Yeah. So it's CSV reader. So it's just reading a CSV. And here, where does where does it run? Where it is? Model dot run. Timestamp and consumption. I think. He's not getting something back right, and I don't understand why. Um, it could be, perhaps, that timestamp and consumption aren't what you think they are right here, but I, I really don't. I really don't know. Can I, why can't I add like a line 95? Really? Why doesn't GIST have that? That's weird. Okay, so I guess I'll just copy and paste it. Uh, 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 doing good. Long time lurker? Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for following my... Hey, look, now there's a link. That's weird. These have hover, but they don't. Anyway, I'm just going to copy this. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for following us on our journey towards understanding and creating intelligent systems. Okay. My only idea, my only idea now is that maybe timestamp and or consum consumption is not what the model expects, is not uh, the type of data the model expects here. Question mark? I don't know. I'm just so confused. There, I'm gonna replace this with a red question mark. <laughs> All right, Mark. Uh, so I'm running through. I'm answering form questions, and uh, I'm trying to help people that had questions while I was gone. Okay. Good side project from Derek Pinto. He used to be a lot more... Uh, oh my god, this is so cool. I want one of these. Uh, we've been talking about making one of these. Check it out. Come on, play it. I'll let you listen to it. Look at this. This is so cool. Okay, so you could use this to create um, a big model of uh, an HTM, uh, like the structure. So, so you know my HTM school videos, the temporal memory one where I've got the big block. You, you could actually physically create that, which would be super cool. We've talked about doing this art installation <laughs> in the office with something like this. They, they make these cube-like things. Is this actually you, Derek? Is, so this is, oops, I gotta figure this out. Is that, act, that does, I think that's him. No, no, I watched the video below on YouTube. I think I can use it to build a tiny simulation of how it absolutely. Um, that's really cool. Because I swear we've, we've, Lewis and I have talked about doing this. <laughs> and we've talked about it with Jeff too. And he's, he was all interested as well. Okay, sorry, let me turn the music back down. Check it out, that's so cool. I gotta get to the end result. But they sell these things already made like this. That is so cool. Is that not cool? That's one of the coolest things. So um, they sell them pre-made and you can light them up different colors. <laughs> All right. 
Yes, that's very cool. Um, VR viewable visualization. Yeah, this is super cool. Um, so I, I don't know. So I don't think I'm going to write this on the uh, write this down, type this down here. But I'm going to see if I can talk about it and and post it up there, because um, we like I said we we've talked about doing this before. So I, there's already a piece of code that will translate. Uh, the state of an HTM, basically the SPTM, you know, SPTM uh, neural layer into 3D coordinates that you could easily map to something like this. It's called Highbrow, and I think it's even on H an HTM community project. Um, and, and I have examples only, yeah, there it is. I have examples in post it here uh, in WebGL, but um, but the logic itself is is completely oh, this isn't it uh, agnostic. So like Lewis has implemented this in C sharp as well, so that we can do translations, basically coordinate translations from an HTM a structure representing an HTM layer, SPTM layer. Um, so that it can be bas basically exploded out into a 3D space and you can easily move it around and stuff. And the state can be reflected in that. So there's some of the work in this has already been done. Um, if anybody's looking at doing something like this, um, we look at that highbrow thing because that, will, that already has code to help translate the state of an HTM and it's not tied to anything. I mean, you just send it an array, right? The, an array is just, which is the state of the cells, and it will turn it into um, three-dimensional structure. So that's super cool. Um, introduce yourself. Some new. Oh, did I miss this one? MH01223. Studying for Master's of Science in the field of space engineering in England. Good luck. Uh, thesis topic, investigate machine learning algorithms, decided on HTM. That's cool. Uh, you know, I hear this quite a bit, which is great to hear. Um, oh, I've got another suggestion for visualization. Math box. I've never tried this before, but that looks cool. WebGL math graphing. So it's, yeah, cool, another suggestion. Audio visualizer, I love WebGL stuff. I love 3JS, or, whoa. <laughs> there you go, some math, math box there. Um, I could check, look into that, but I'm not doing that right now. I'm, for, for anyone watching, you can take a look at that. Uh, okay, eventually I'd like to form a concept of operations for an HTM network working on board a satellite on some telemetry channels, which involves quantifying the memory requirements of high performing HTM network and a trade off analysis regarding performance and time resolution, number of input features, number of channels being studied, etc. It's complex. Appreciate advice. Um, yeah, the more specifically you show us your data, yeah. Data early. <laughs> I agree with Sam. Show us the data er early. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> ANN scalar matrix hashing encoder. Oh, this is an older topic. Rev updated. I think I ended up getting something working along these lines. Oh, okay, I'm gonna get to that. I think that's a new topic and I'll get to in a moment. Python 3 PyPy Community Fork namespace. This was in response to a post that I made <clears throat> recently. Um, trying to figure out what exactly we're gonna call things and in, in, you know when we pip install things in Python 3. Um, so David is one of the main work uh, programmers on the NuPic community fork, the NuPic CPP. 
He says, I'm giving some thought to the namespace used in the community fork. Using HTM as the PyPy package name is not a problem, but I was wondering if you'd vision this to extend to the directory names we use in .py code and C++ code and the namespaces within the code. Uh, GitHub community rather than HTM community. So yes to this. That's what I was thinking. Repository, directory structure, repo source, HTML algorithms rather than repo source NUPIC algorithms. You know, this this does make sense to me. I think that is how we would want to do it. Yes, 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 to all these things, right. Um, in C++, using namespace HTM rather than namespace NUPIC. We certainly could do that if that's what you like, but it might be quite confusing for people at first, but in the long run, it might be better to use entirely separate namespaces to avoid name collisions. What are your thoughts? Is there already a PyPy login that should be used to register the package names for the HTM community packages? I think that you should control that login. If there is, please register HTM as our package name. I don't think it's taken. Okay. I think I can do that. Um, hey, Marty, thanks for joining the live stream. I'm, I'm, I'm catching up on forum posts because I was out of the office all last week and I am talking about the future of HTM in Python 3 with David Keeney here. And I love all, of, uh, yes, this is exactly what I want to do, David. This is exactly what I want to do. And I will take care of this. Okay. Okay. David, you are spot on. That is exactly what I prefer to do. I think it will be worth it in the long run, especially, yes, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I mean, now's the time to, now's the time to make changes like this. Now is the, I'll say that, <laughs> make big changes like this. Okay, uh, meaning before, no, I'm just gonna leave it. Uh, I will take care of this and get back to you guys. All right. Sorry, I'm taking notes on my whiteboard. Okay. All right. Neural network rotational architecture mirrors many columns. I found a paper on neural network architecture and I think mirrors part of the HTM theory. If you squint, you can see that many columns grid cells work more on rotation than adding or multiplying vector points together. In this, oh, because this is about rotational unit of memory. Um, rotational unit. This reminds me more of like head, head direction than, so maybe, you know, we've, we've said you can make the relationship right between mini columns and grid cell modules, which then you can make the relationship between mini columns and orientation modules, perhaps, or head direction modules or whatever. Uh, so sure. I think there's probably something related here. I think we'll continue um, scrutiny of the experimental neuroscience will help us figure out what exactly the relationship is. I think it's, I feel, I'm not a new meta researcher. I am a community manager, but I get to see a lot of the research and it feels to me like it would be awesome if we could make the whole mini column idea work with the grid cell module thing. Um, oh, this has to do with vector multiplication in the algorithm space. Okay. So this is not what I was thinking about. I was just about to read your response, Mark. Let me try and get read his first. I think, if, uh, do I, I wonder if, I don't wanna read this paper right now. 
So I'm just going to read your response. This is approach I outlined in the PD. Oh, this is right. I don't know what the Cooper RBF model is, but I understand what you're saying that this is uh, the approach of the PDP books. Considering that SDRs are positional codes, have you considered set theory as a tool for analysis? That's a good response. Okay, that, that makes sense. Where was I? Uh, general analysis of HTM learning and predictive abilities. It's not a unisphere. Okay, I don't remember this. Oh yeah, I do remember this. I keep forgetting to mark this, but okay. Um, have you tried to do analysis? Uh, right. So I think I was hoping I could um, get this person to read about data encoding because I think understanding data encoding in a temporal stream would kind of lead him in the right direction to answer his other questions. Sam pointed him to some of the papers. Uh, encoding could effectively be part of such kind of studies, effect of the encoder type and the performance. But what I meant is more about measuring the capacity of SP and TM to learn and predict sequences based on metrics like number of sequences, the order of sequences, number of inputs, type of causality between inputs, including an analysis of the effect of HTM parameters on the performance. Um, okay, so he found the paper that he wanted. That's all I'm caring about right now. I think he's just looking for papers. This paper also Compares HTM prediction to ARIMA. I think I remember that. Um, right, this was the uh, NAB paper, I think. Okay, thank you, Sam. Okay, a group of questions based on reading about the two grid cell modules. Oh boy. That's, that's a big. <laughs> I've been reading, okay, first of all, this isn't paper, so I'm going to move this. I've been reading the preprints of the newer papers on the site, and I have a, a, a so I want to put this in theory, not papers, because the papers section is just where we put, like, here's a new paper and discussion specifically about the paper. So this is spanning many papers. Um, reading preprints and here are the questions. It seems that in the paper, a theory of how um, you tried to answer and gave up. Well, that may be what I do too. Uh, assumption is that as you explore an object with one fingertip, your eyes closed, you have a location vector and a sensory vector. The location vector synapses on the distal dendrites of the cells in a mini column. Yes, the in in layer. To, wait, in layer, uh, well, doesn't matter, in layer four, right? Yeah, I, I have to think of the sensory versus the location layer idea. Um, the way the location vector is created is not a topic of the paper, right? In addition, there's an output layer that has an arbitrary representation for a particular object, which stays constant as you explore the object with your finger, but then there's another paper title locations in the cort neocortex that came out later, which dispenses with dispenses with the output layer and has a sensory layer and that modulates distal synapse. Yes, yes. Furthermore, the location layer in this new paper is made up of several grid cell modules, each of, of which have cells that connect to the entire sensory layer. <laughs> okay, yes. Is my understanding correct? Yes. <laughs> it's a good, decent summary, I think. Um, the second article goes over the standard grid cell theory a bit and says that the very first time uh, that a rodent is released into an artificial environment, <clears throat> let's say a walled space with various features at different points, such as a tree and a stream, each grid cell module will start off with one bump and only one bump at a random point. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's true because it's, I mean, the bumps move. So, so it's many bumps in uh, 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 specifying a location, but the, but, and those are random. So it's like the arrangement of those, that grid, so the starting point, the starting parameters of, of that grid, I think is random. That's, that's what identifies a random point. Damn it. I keep forgetting to 
mark my stream. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't when I say when you say one bump, it's not like it's just uh, one bump. There's a it's it's a bunch of bumps um, initialized in a random way. Uh, this is a distributed function. Uh, does this you're in orientation, or is this are you relating this to his uh, our our paper? Well, just the locations because if we're this isn't talking about orientation. Uh, anyway, let me try and answer this question in res in the context of the papers that he's talking about. Each grid cell module start off with one bump at a random point. If that's true, then if the mouse were released for the first time via a different door into the same environment, would it start off with the same bumps? If not, how do you have constancy in learning locations of features? So I think that you need to look into place cells. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna try and answer this without too much text. Uh, it's too big for chat, okay. So let's say number one, yes. <laughs> um, number two, place cells. Uh, how do you have constancy in learning locations? Of, so you need pl place cells for this, which can identify a room based on a landmark in the room. The grid cell module bumps um, anchor to the place field, I'll call it. Um, this is ongoing theory, so we don't have all the answers yet. Fair enough. <laughs> Suppose a model based on time, the old sequence model where the current vector makes predictions via modulatory synapses on cells. Yes, okay, the TM model. You have learned a sequence of features ABC. Another sequence learned is EC. Suppose that C is not represented by a vector of many, many columns, but just by one many column, okay. In that case, the firing one particular cell in that mini column when it is not bursting would correspond to the previous history E or B, or B, right? Could respond to, or, and the firing of another cell in that mini column could correspond to the history A, B. Okay, hold on. So he's saying we have a, a cell firing in a mini column that represents E, and it might be I don't think that's true. Um, if there's a cell, f if a cell fires in that mini column, it would mean E. Another cell firing that mini column would mean E after A, B, or C. Wait, 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 C, sorry. I'm getting my E's and C's and everything mixed up. Um, so we have a mini column firing for C. One of it, this, uh, one cell is becomes active within that mini column because um, it was correctly predicted. Um, and I don't think there is not another cell in that mini column that would, there is another cell that would correspond to the history. Yes. Okay. So, but it's, it would not be firing. There would be another cell in the in that C mini column that repre A B C but it would not be would not be firing in your example. Uh, sequence. Okay, I think that's correct. Um Mark says, subiculum neurons map the current axis of travel. Okay. But we're, I'm not talking about orientation here. I'm trying to answer this question in, in context of the 
the papers that he's asking them about. So why grid cells? According to the various papers, the representations of location are dimensionless. Um, but not only that, but grid cells mean the origin of the object being looked at can be translated in space. In other words, recognition is variant. Grid cells don't explain orientation and variance. And okay, I'm gonna. Uh, if the why grid cells question is because they are um, they are observed in experimental neuroscience and our mission is understand how intelligence works brains so understanding grid cells seems really important I mean I'm not going to answer your te technical questions there um, maybe there's better ways to do it but we're definitely and about the dimensionless the origin origin uh, the origin is just the first point, uh, I think. Um, why grid cell? Let me answer this first. Why? Why grid cells? Um, grid cells don't explain orientation invariance and scale invariance. No, they don't, but we're, that's, we're, that's what we're working on. We think perhaps grid cell behavior, potentially, the, like the, um, the type of grittiness in, in, the, this, in, our, in the neuroscience community, you will hear the term grittiness thrown around sometimes. Um, anyway, I think I'm gonna leave, leave it at that and I'm not gonna touch the other question just cause I don't wanna, I wanna move on. If you really wanna engage about that specific question. Let's start another chat. Um, in the first paper, it says lower levels might not sense enough of the environment to form a model of a big object. So they'd learn parts of an object, like the leg of an elephant. What happens if the sensory patch that feeds the lower level strays to the ear of an elephant? Um, It would be modeling an ear. I mean, I don't know, right? <laughs> what happens is it, it would be ear of an elephant. Or in the example of a fingertip, I don't know. I'm going to leave it at that. And modeling should be right with two L's or one honestly okay <clears throat> in, the in the latter model okay it's nine o'clock I'm just going to keep an eye on my time at 10 o'clock I've got a stand-up meeting so I need to need to get through this uh, in the later model in if your first encounter of an object activates random bumps in the grid cell modules in one column in your neocortex <clears throat> Mark is commenting on, on this. The, the question is sort of the wrong way to think about this. We know that the eye saccades to different parts and we build that into an object. Yeah, that's, that's sort of what I was trying to think about. I mean, it, <clears throat> he's right. <laughs> it's not like, like when you're touching an elephant, your, your, your fingers like skin, 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 this feels like skin. But if you move your whole hands around it, it's, you're getting a bigger picture of the thing. And, and the lower, I think, levels of the sensory hierarchy or continuing to model skin and passing up perhaps a bunch of uh, some representations of uh, you're touching skin at this orientation or something like that to the higher levels of the hierarchy which are then saying seeing a bigger object based on larger you know in space sensory input in space um Six was first encounter of if your first encounter of an object activates random bumps in the grid cell modules in one column of your neocortex, what will happen five days from now if you encounter the same object? It would seem that you have to, to start off with the same representation. So if you learn an object um, and you 
start off with a random random bumps and then learn the object by moving through its space or whatever. Five day, days from now, when you encounter the same object, you would, um, well, okay. Once you've learned an object, you infer, you, you, you compare, let's say this, you compare um, income coming sensory input to it. Uh, I don't know what that. You compare incoming sensory input to all the objects you've learned, uh, narrowing down <clears throat> until you match the object. Um, five days from now. <laughs> okay. Uh, you don't start with the same representation, but you end with it by continue by um, n narrowing down SDR unions until you are left with the object. Narrowing down SDR unions through sensory movement through in object space, in object space, let's say, until you are left with the object. I hope that sort of makes sense. You don't start with the same representation, but you end with it by narrowing down SDR unions through sensory movement in object space until you are left with the object. This is sort of a long question. You know what I should do is just since I'm answering every one of these, I'll just make this an ordered list. Boop. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, you think I should link to short term memory? Let's see. Could be relevant. That's a good point. I, we can link them to that. As far as short-term memory, uh, let's say related. How's that? There you reference. Okay, let's go. Hey, Falco, how you doing? In the later model, there are two layers that interact. As they interact, they narrow down unions of possibilities with both layers. So he sort of understands this. So I so don't understand why you don't get that question number six if you understand the narrowing down of unions you should understand that they don't start off with the same representation but they end up with the same representation so let's suppose that the um my family time was great i had a very relaxing week last week um in the in the latter later model there are two layers that interact i've already read this Let's suppose that the location vector is made up of three mini columns. Let's suppose the location vector. Let's not. Well, we can't assume that the location vector. No, no, no. So <clears throat> here's where you're going wrong. We can't assume that. I don't think so. I mean, the location vector does whatever the location vector does, and it's input to another uh, layer of cells in some way. So whether it's many columns or not, or how many many columns it is or anything, that's doesn't matter. We should be able to take some portion of that output and feed it into a layer, not knowing anything about it. Um, so I'm afraid perhaps this is too, can I do this? No. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can just quote it like this. No. How can I... I want an inline quote. Quote... That does not work. There it does. It does. It does. That works. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't work, though. I'll just leave it like that. And I will say... Okay, I think... I think there is something wrong with this assumption. 
the layer of cells getting location input can't make any assumptions about the structure of the layer providing the input. This is a core principle of the common cortical, well, let's say of the, let's call this what it is, the thousand brains theory um, that we're, that we talk about. Um, I don't really understand the question. It might it mean that the first two mini columns have narrowed down. So maybe you're just talking about what the output represents, but but I mean, I, I don't necessarily, as long as the, uh, let me just say this, as long as the location layer output is stable, um, meaning locations are unique, given, let's say consistent input, okay? So I say sensory, let's just say input. That, that's all that matters. Okay, I hope I hope this helps a bit. Okay. All right. Did I get did I get through everything? I can't have. No, no, no. There's more. Okay. About HTM's input. Okay, I'll be right back. I need to use the restroom. I'll be right back. Okay, about HTM's input. Again, this isn't on a paper. I have a question about HTM algorithm based on the one described in the paper. How, so what I'll do is move this to this paper. We will change this. Um, actually, what I wanna do is select post, select, move to Three of our columns, and that's not even the name of the paper. Hold on a second. What was the paper? Enable learning the structure of the world. That's the columns paper. So why isn't it? Uh, uh, stop it. Hey, theory.
output layer as described in did I not this doesn't make sense I swear this has its own this has its own uh, page I swear it does why would it not did I change it somehow no okay hold on this one also needs to be moved where is the the columns paper There it is. Why does the neocortex... Oh, so I think we changed the name of it. Okay, so I should I should probably update this. You meant to com slash papers. Oh, great. More stream lags than normal? Let's see. Ugh. See, I don't think this is... I can't tell if this is my internet or if it's Twitch, because April 22nd, that's today. And there's definitely some lags here. Stable, unstable. Notify me if my stream becomes unstable. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, so apparently I have a way to um, identify problems. So I'll leave this up and see what happens. If you refresh once in a while, you can follow. Okay, laggy. Okay, yeah, I guess so. Try um, turning off the low latency settings or enabling the whatever. Okay, back to... Um, the columns paper theory of how columns in the neocortex enable. So let's change this and I'm going to update this to point to the right place and have the right name, the updated name, okay. And let's update this to um, now that it's been released not what I wanted. <laughs> I'm just going to point it to here. Actually, yeah, let's point it right here. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you guys. I, I got the I got two internets at right now. So if this one goes south, I can switch to my other one, but they're both supposedly high speed. Which is a bummer. Uh, okay. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. I'm gonna leave my inspector up and we'll see what happens. Okay, okay, so now I want to move to this, and there it is theory of how. So we're gonna move it there. And uh, this first question. Everyone represent an hi a hierarchical model, which is at least two sets of columns, the output of column A in the first. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, about the ba basal input. Are, 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 okay, so I, need, I just want to clarify. Jinx, Jing, Jinwix, uh, just to clarify this paper says nothing about the hierarchical structure. Um, we are not making any theories right now involving hierarchy. Just leave it at that, okay. Where was I? Okay, so I moved that one. That one's locked and moved. Monoton, oh, this other one, I'm gonna move this one too. I'm gonna move all this stuff. 
because uh, this is all select all and we're going to move them all to the same place theory of that move so you guys when you're posting a question about a paper just post it right on the paper uh, page if you can find it obviously this one was hard because it was named wrong so I don't blame you reading through the paper it seems obvious to me that the structure of the input layer of a column is equivalent to the many columns, cells, connections, objects in the Dupic library interact upon by standard. Yes. Good. <laughs> um, and the first set of simulations in the input layer of each column consists of 150 mini columns with 16 cells per mini column, a total of 2,400 cells. I do not see, though, a corresponding data structure algorithm for the output layer of the column as described in the paper in the Nupic code. Um, the output layer of each column consists Yes, is there any code for the paper? There is, there you go. And good answer. Okay, good answer, thank you. Where's my badge? You're gonna get a good answer badge. Good answer. Thank you, Roger T. Um, thank you for the thank you. They meant to code for this, oh, again. Yep, getting right to the meat of stuff. Hey, good, another good answer there. Why isn't that working? Oh, it's uh, this paper, Untangling. Yeah, this was pretty recent, I think. All right, good answer, good answer. Back to alternating loss functions for evolution algorithms. Uh, I think he needs a thalamus. Oh wait, I missed some chat. <laughs> okay. Um, after messing with switching loss functions, doesn't work well. Oh yeah, we were just. Uh, this is from Sean. Um, they're talking about an, an idea of um, running. I think multiple loss functions at once and sort of dynamically switching between them, which is an interesting idea. And then I thought. Somebody should have already done that. And then Marty found out that somebody had already done it. Um, I tried to put as much as I could about HTMs into a single picture. Ooh, let's look at the picture. How do I, how do I look at it bigger? I'm going to download it. Here we go. So, okay. So this is a column, cortical column. It's got L5, L6A, L2, 3, input coming into L4. Whoops. That's not what I wanted to do. There. <laughs> input coming in here. Recognition of objects are. Okay, so. Objects, what, 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 where? So I don't know about this. So, okay, so the what and the where, I, I would stay away from that. I don't, there's not two pathways. So let me just mention that. I, I like the, uh, I, I like the effort, but the, I don't think what and where are right. Um, I would not, my first impression, or my first input is that this is, all happening in either what, where, or both. I see you have um, what and where labeled on different layers, and I don't think it works that way. I think that you're doing this that this process is running in both spaces simultaneously. I, I think that. I think this process is running in both spaces simultaneously. L2 and 3 might be, yeah, eventually they'll probably will have to be split up, but I don't know enough to say anything about it, honestly. Uh, okay. Did I already? Oh, hey, Brev. Hello, Brev. First, 
Oh, hi, I suddenly went down the HTML encoding with gray codes rabbit hole about a month ago and ended up here. I haven't looked at this yet. This sim, I, I saw it, and, but I haven't, um, let me come back to that. And Mark, you're explaining gray code. I don't really know what gray code is. What is gray code? Reflected binary, co oh. Oh, I think I know what that is. Ordering of a binary numeral system such that two successive values differ only in one bit. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Huh, okay. Uh, gray code is good for dealing with sensors where you need to sort between two adjacent codes. It is a packed code and not really compatible with SDRs. For SDRs, you have the position of the bits representing value like this. Yeah. Yes. With rods and cones, we have a mixed population of cells that form the SDRs. This is nice. In this case, yeah, I think this is more like how it really works. Yeah, as far as the OP is concerned about the number of columns required to code for colors, the brain deals with problem coding for colors at a much lower spatial resolution than for brightness. Yes, absolutely. For example, in the old NTSC color television standards, the color was added as a second lower resolution stream that was phase coded to indicate what color tint should be added to the luminance information. Hmm. It's an interesting tidbit. Um, I like that answer. I'm going to, I'm going to do this community helper. <laughs> I love I love this mark. I don't know where you got this, but it's cool. It explains it really well. Okay, let's go to this simhash distributed scalar encoder and try and understand it. A locality sensitive hashing approach towards encoding semantic data into SDRs ready to be fed. Did you make did you make this like this looks very well documented. <laughs> I'm assuming there's a a GitHub or something, isn't there? It, uh, it uses SimHash algorithm to accomplish this. So it's a locality, a locality sensitive hashing. Um, this similar, this reminds me of the geospatial or the coordinate encoder, you know. Um, I don't know the SimHash algorithm. Quickly estimating how similar two sets are. Used by Google Crawler to find near duplicate pages. Okay. And there's a paper, which I'm not gonna read right now. This encoder is sibling with the original scalar encoder and the RDSE. The static bucketing strategy here is generally lifted straight from the RDSE, although the contents and representations are created differently. Instead of creating a random hash for our target bucket, we first generate a SHA-3 shake-256 hash. This is probably part of the sim hash algorithm. Um, hash of the bucket index. Okay, I'm skipping some of the details. We then create a weighted sim hash for our target bucket index. The sim hash output will represent both individual bucket value and represent the relations between nearby neighbor values in bucket space. Okay, okay. A, s a stable number of on bits is achieved during final collapsing step of sim hashing. So, okay, feature comparison with the original scalar, the RDSC sim hash. Collisions allowed. Yes, good. So it's like the RDSC semantic continuity. This is a custom random map, and this is using SimHash for that, and this is physical adjacency, period wrapping. Yes, but not on the RDSC, but you can wrap. So you could use the SimHash encoder to create um, cyclic encoders, okay? And we'll get to doing working with cyclic encoders on, on my building HTM systems stream, if you look at my events page. Uh, so, 
and coatings for wrapped edge buckets will adapt with bucket growth. That's interesting. Periodic wrapping, lookup tables. So you can't do a lookup table, but that that would be useful for would that be useful for decoding? Topology, no. Required parameters, resolution, other parameters, bucket radius, and periodic. Okay, cool. So it's it can be periodic, which is a bonus. Scalar encoder performance comparison test for run. Um, in the Nupic docs algorithm tutorial. Okay, so we're, whoops. The usual hot gem data was used, first 3,000 rows. Okay, so we're just doing coding um, speed. Okay, so min, so 0 to 100, or we're, or we're doing the RDSC with a different resolution. MAPE, MAE, RMSC, so these are error values and times. I don't know these well enough to know how how comparable these are, but I'm assuming that uh, Brev has been diligent about this. Um, so, so it's a little slower. Oh, okay, so we could add lookup tables to make it faster. And the, we're talking about hamming distance here. So won't this, will this hamming distance change depending on the resolution? Or is that, um, uh, I forget the uh, hamming distance is like overlap, right? Okay, how it works. Step one, input some scalar values, blah, 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 map to buckets. Map input values to bucket indices using the formula from RDSC. And this is sort of our random, yeah, based on resolution sort of starting point, right? So then we have buckets and hash the bucket index. Hash bucket index value of a target bucket. And neighbors. Okay, so you hash the bucket and its neighbors. So say we're targeting three. So we're, we're gonna get the hashes for it and its neighbors. So this is convert binary zeros and hashes to integer negative ones. Okay. Weight bucket hashes. Target bucket in center of is the heaviest. Okay, so we're waiting. Oh, okay, interesting. So the zeros turn into negative ones, and then the summed weighted binary columns. Hash column summations. So this is column one is negative three. This is column two is one, right? Is that right? Negative one, negative two, negative one, zero, negative one, zero, negative one, zero. No, that's zero. So I'm, gonna, something, I'm wrong about that. So bucket three, so, oh, oh, we're summing them like, like that? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So this is minus one plus two, which is one plus three, four, two, one, one. Yeah. Okay, so these are the columns. Interesting. So then we're going to add up all the, the columns. Collapse integer sums back to binary. Collapse the sums back to binary for the final sim hash value for our target bucket. A regular sim hash will change all sums greater than zero to a binary one, while all sums less than zero change to a binary zero. The sim hash will usually result in about 50% sparsity. Interesting. So then we've got source, source code, code reviews, my first real Python project. Tests, cap P. Uh, so he's going to create a CPP version, lower and stabilize average hamming distance between buckets. This video seems helpful. What video is that? You can get attractive complexity. You can do it really. That does look beyond me, too. Um, 
Brev, this is great. Great work. I'm gonna give an awesome, give, give an awesome badge for that. Cool. Um, well, it looks like what you might use this for is if you want a periodic encoder, scalar encoder, that um, you don't have to specify min and max. So what I'm seeing here, my favorite thing at least is this. It can, it, it can be um, periodic and you can give it a resolution instead of a min and max, which is the good thing about the random distributed encoder is you don't have to worry about min and max. It sort of self expands, but you can't loop it around. You can't say that, you know, my max value is close to my min value, but with this, you can. So that's cool. That's very cool. So yeah, that's a good point. Let me, oh, 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 DMAC is in on this. this. Coder is interesting, if I understand correctly. The goal is to greatly increase the radius of the encoding, so to have a nonlinear semantic similarity. Oh, I didn't even realize that. That's true. You could, you could do that. Uh, so DMAC wrote the unit tests for the RDSC. They check for semantic similarity by running through a range of values, measuring the overlap between consecutive output. Okay, okay. Python is acceptable for an encoder. Uh, don't bother, yes, good. Uh, the adaptive scalar coder is obsoleted by the RDSC, yes. I would recommend against using a cryptographic hash function. It's not critical, but here are some potential issues. Time consuming to compute, typically seeded with random numbers. Okay, very cool. Thanks for the reply. The goal is really to exact same as the RDSC, just accomplish it with a different method. By tuning some of the parameter encoder parameters, one could maybe accomplish something like you have in your graphic, but it was not a goal. Cool. After I read the description, how does SimHash fare against 1D grid cell? Maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like they have similar properties. That might be, yeah. Thanks for sharing your interest. I'm very interested in knowing which task. Okay, very, very nice. Great job, Rev. I like um, the biggest drawback of the RDSE. In my O, in my H O, is its lack of period periodicity, period periodicity. Wait, how period periodicity? How do you? What am I trying to say here? Periodicity. There we go. Periodicity. Okay. Periodicity, I got it. <laughs> Thanks, spell check. Okay, um, I've, I sort of kept up with this, the um, catastrophic forgetting thing. Are there any good tests that I can run in Python to check if a network has overcome catastrophic forgetting? Lots of papers, but I don't see a database to check on. Uh, I might have set something similar by trying to get a spatial pooler to learn all the Unicode. Oh. Um, I set up a regular PyTorch autoencoder with one hidden layer and then added boosting and K winners to the middle of it to make it sparse. Uh, yes, we talked about that. This ended up selecting different neurons for representing different inputs. So Chinese like inputs would always select the Chinese neurons and emoji like inputs would always select the emoji neurons. There would be some variations for other neurons to cover. However, that doesn't mean it completely overcomes catastrophic forgetting. It could quite it could never quite recognize all the letters. I could see it retraining even after hours and hours of training, smoothly moving from one character to the actual input, but I could see that I could see many different classes of characters guessed at first. So maybe so it may be more robust to catastrophic forgetting than other networks. So temporal memory similarly uses different subsets of total neurons. So, so I think it would be similarly more robust to catastrophic forgetting. Um, Paul says, I know the original question was about temporal memory, but it's probably worth mentioning that there is a difference between the TM algorithm and the SP algorithm. 
which is probably pretty relevant here. In SP, each mini column trains a single segment. This increased increases the chances of things being forgotten when the same segments are retrained on some new input. Each mini column trains on a single segment. Right, right, right. Uh, yes, that makes sense. This is purely intuition, but I suspect the TM algorithm is going to be more robust against this problem than the SP. I think so. Bah, tachyon, a Chinese rem remainder theorem type of encoder should be similar to what Marty was thinking about when he thought about a 1D grid cell type of encoder. You can make the encoder pay attention to every two or five or K element of any number. Yeah. That's okay, I think I get it. Okay, second order optimization methods to SGD convergence. This is a deep learning thing. Optimizing gradient descent. Da, 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 da. I don't know deep learning very well. I'm sorry. Model param for nab. Thank you. Uh, relative coordinate encoder. Woke up thinking about the coordinate encoder and what it would mean if the squares were relative to a particular point rather than objectively laid out. As an example, Imagine an owner who put a smart tag on her pet, which could track them on Google Maps. That's how the current coordinate encoder might work. But what if the um, but what if the tag sent its location relative to the owner's phone? It might still need to be an effectively finite plane, but a specific square in the encoder doesn't equate to a fixed maps grid. I can imagine a lot of scenarios where tracking an object relative to a reference point would be useful. I do not think there is there are necessarily practical implications of using the existing coordinate encoder for this purpose as just using relative XY values instead of absolute. Instead I'm curious if the community thinks of this approach as implications. Does it violate any assumptions about the coordinate encoder? Um, it reminds me reminds me of the idea of is me of let's just say displacement cells which can indicate um, a relative location from a point I'll leave it at that okay what am, am I did I make it through everything almost almost misunderstood behavior uh, okay, this was just in response to what I just said. Uh, I think you mean, yes, uh, you catch me. Uh, the anomaly scores should go down overall as patterns are learned. The anomaly scores received in the validity phase. It means I finished to train the SP and TM and I received a high anomaly score in the same position in the validity after I finished to training the model on valid logs. I don't understand, okay, so I don't under understand the phases of your training. Um, with, with temporal models like HTM, um, you don't have different training versus testing versus validation data. You, you simply have it from one data stream representing reality and you can attach the, a the htm to it <clears throat> and turn learning on to learn the model may be trained on any part of the data stream, but the sequential. I suggest you choose a number of data points to train HTM models on and always start evaluating model after they see that many points. I hope that makes sense. Uh, okay. Did 
Did I get everything? Okay, those are just a couple of likes. I think I got through this. I think I got through the forum.